Welcome back to RRC Restoration. In the last episode, we took the engine from a complete unit to this pile of parts. In this episode, the aim will be to get the engine built back up and put back in the frame along with a few other jobs. So, let's get started. My first task is going to be descaling the block. As I'm sure you all remember from last time, all of the coolant passages are almost entirely blocked. So this is what I'm talking about. You can see the sheer amount of scale build up and how it's furred up the water galleries and stopped the coolant from doing its job and cooling the engine. To remove this build up I'm going to put the block in a bath of hot water and add to it some central heating cleaner as this should soften the build up and allow it to dissolve and be able to be washed out with a blast from the hose. While the block is steeping, let's crack on with getting all the other parts cleaned up. After all the parts were blasted, they were washed and dried several times to make sure that no blasting residue remained anywhere on them. Now, let's check on how the block is looking. That's looking a million times better already. You can actually see the bottom of the galleries now. With a little blast from the hose, the rest should come away nicely. With the parts now blasted and cleaned several times, they have been masked up and loaded into the spray booth and away a nice coat of etch primer.
I'm going straight from aerosol etch primer to base coat as I want the coating thickness as thin as possible as I want to retain the texture and casting marks just like it was when it left Honda in 1990. With the base coat laid and dried, I need to protect the finish and for that I'm using a very thin layer of 2K clear. While the paint is curing, I'm going to get on with cleaning up the rest of the parts, starting with the pistons. Apart from a little carbon build up on the crown of the piston, it's in really good condition. So I will be able to clean it up and reuse it, along with the other three pistons. And while I'm cleaning alloy, it makes sense to clean up the sump at the same time. Now before we start cleaning, it's important to take your brush and beat the devil out of it. Now we're ready to start painting, I mean cleaning. My vapour blaster is then used to polish the alloy back to as new condition. The last step in reconditioning the pistons is to give them a quick ultrasonic clean to make sure no glass bead remains trapped anywhere on them.
Now that the sump looks good again, the bolts are rather letting the side down. So let's fix that right now. With the rust and old plating removed from the bolts, I now need to protect them again. So it's time to break out the plating system again. By calculating the area of the bolts, I know that I need roughly 2.15 amps of current to plate them correctly. And while that's doing its thing, let's check on the pistons. Lovely, just as good as new. And I know that for a fact, as I have checked them with the micrometer, along with all the other important bits you see here. Well, the plating turned out beautifully, now let's make it super durable with a bit of passivation. Good as new. Now, let's make the sump plug gold instead of silver, shall we? Lovely. While off camera I took the liberty of spending a few hours plating all the other hardware we need so that now we are ready to crack on with the main event, getting the engine back into one piece.
With the oil pump in place, I now need to install the sump temporarily so that I can work on the top side of the crankcase. Smooth as silk. The bowls are in really good condition, apart from a bit of surface rust, but that's nothing a quick hone can't fix. One bore perfectly honed and ready for service. Only another three to go. Well, with the bowls honed, I now need to give them a seriously good clean to make sure no grit from the grinding stones remain, as that's a great way to destroy a new set of piston rings very quickly. Well that's one piston assembled, and the rings will be clocked just before being installed. 
When assembling the pistons and rods, special attention needs to be paid on where they will be placed on the engine, as the rear rods are different from the fronts, and the oil hole on all of them must face the rear of the engine. And once again, checking the orientation of the parts. The last step is to fit some nice new shell bearings. Now it's finally time to get the two halves joined back together.
The top casing bolts are only nip tight at the moment as the main bolts on the underside need to be installed and torqued first to ensure the casings are pulled together evenly. With the bolts torqued to spec, I can now fit the sump back on properly with a new gasket and its freshly plated bolts. Now, let's get the top casing torqued down. Well, that's a good sign. It turns over by hand very smoothly and the rings are sweeping all four bores evenly and cleanly. So, let's continue building. The clutch pack isn't in bad condition, but while I'm here, it's well worth just renewing it for peace of mind. The clutch basket is also in very good condition. There is some wear marks and that's to be expected, but the main thing here is there isn't any grooving for the friction plates to get hung up on.
Before reinstalling the clutch springs, I need to make sure that they are still within spec. Well within spec. Looks fine from this side, not so pretty from this side. So let's replace it with a nice shiny new clutch nut.
Well that's everything that needs to be done on the clutch side of the engine. So now I can get the casing bolted back into place and then we can jump over to the other side of the engine and get the generator and flywheel fitted. Before torquing down the top bolt, I need to fit the clutch cable bracket. Now it's time to fit the cylinder heads, starting with the rear bank, so I need to set it to TDC before continuing. You may remember in the last episode I sent the heads away for machining, as I assumed they would be warped. It turns out that they weren't warped, so all that was done was a quick clean up pass on the mill, and happily, that means that next to no material was removed, so shimming the valve train won't be required on this one. I should mention at this point that when the heads were away, the valve stem oil seals were replaced while the valves and springs were out, just in case you thought I'd forgotten about them.
since the front cylinders are a mirror image of the rear, I'll just jump ahead here. And with that last cover in place, the engine is now ready for reinstallation in the frame. But before that, let's remind ourselves of just how grubby this engine was before. And for the finishing touch before putting it in the frame, a nice OEM replica decal. The eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed a few extra items on the frame since we last saw it. Between the previous episode and this one, i done a lot of little jobs that you've all seen me doing before, like stripping and powder coating the bracketry for the instrument cluster and headlights, as well as refitting them to the frame. I've also rebuilt the brake calipers and master cylinders off camera since you've seen me do that job so many times before. Now, let's get back to the engine.
it's finally starting to look like a motorcycle again. Just another couple of little jobs to do, and then we can call this episode done. And with those last bolts torqued, I'm going to call it a day on this episode, as it's quite a long one already. But I'm very happy with the progress that has been made. The engine has been rebuilt and is now sitting pretty in the frame, and most of the controls are also now restored and reinstalled. All that's left now on the mechanical side of things is to get the cooling system back in place, get the exhaust cleaned up and reinstalled, and of course, get the electrics sorted and get the carbs split and cleaned up. So, fingers crossed by the end of the next episode, we will have a VFR that will be ready to run. So, I hope to see you all there. Bye bye!